This is episode number 53, featuring Plein Air Salon winner Kathleen Hudson. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we dive deeply into the world of outdoor painting, often called Plein Air painting. For those of you who don't know, Plein Air is a French term, essentially, which has come to mean painting outdoors or the open air. The French say Plein Air, others say Plain Air, but no matter how you say it, there's a huge movement of artists around the world going outdoors to paint. This show is all about that booming movement, uh, probably the largest art movement in history. It's all about the painters, the collectors, the galleries, the movement, and the art. The podcast is brought to you by Fall Color Week, Publishers Invitational, which is my painter's retreat at Acadia National Park in Maine, coming up in October during the peak of fall color. But there's so much more to paint because uh, you're hanging out with friends. You've got all this incredible coastal scenery, rocks. You've got lobster boats, beautiful harbors, you know, lighthouses. It's pretty amazing. And um, there's painting scenes just at every corner. You can learn more at Fall Color Week. Dot com. Now, it's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting, and you can help by sharing the podcast with your friends, talking to them about plein air painting, or get out on social media and talk about the podcast. And I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every single week and leave a comment or a rating if you would. And if you have feedback, contact me, Eric, at plenairmagazine.com. The interview is brought to you by our new Figurative Art Convention and Expo. It features amazing portrait and figure painters like Juliet Aristides, Jack, Jacob Collins, Patty Watwood, Max Ginsburg, Daniel Graves, Stephen Assale, Gregory Mortensen, David LaFell, Jeremy Lipking, Sherry McGraw, Graydon Parrish, Dan Gerhartz, Jordan Sokol, Michael Mettler, and scholars Donald Cuspit and Stephen Hicks. Uh, for those of you who do plein air, but you also do figure, this is a very cool place for you to go. It's going to be in Miami in November, and the price goes up after Labor Day at midnight, so you want to get into it. You can learn more at figurativeartconvention.com, which is called FACE. Let's get right to our interview with the amazing Kathleen Hudson. Today on the plein air podcast, we have Kathleen Hudson. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you. And we're talking to you from where? Lexington, Kentucky, maybe? That is correct. My hometown. Well, you and I first met at the Plein Air Convention, and the first time we met is when I awarded you a big, giant $15,000 check for being the winner, the 2016 winner of the Plein Air Salon. Congratulations. Well, thank you again. Those are great circumstances under which to meet. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. Um, so... <laughs> I, sure. I don't want to talk a lot about the contest, but I, I am curious. Um, tell me your story. Help me understand the story of, of uh, why you decided to enter. And, you know, here you are, somebody that I, I think a lot of us had never been aware of yet, and yet you won the grand prize up, up against some pretty major people. So what, what prompted you to enter? What prompted you to have the confidence that maybe you had a shot what was that all about? Well, I, I really had confidence in um, that particular painting. Um, and I'd, I'd entered the salon before and had, um, you know, hadn't gotten one into the, the final round, so to right. speak. Um, but, um, but I hadn't, I actually hadn't entered very frequently in, in this last year's competition. And so it was, the very last night um, that that they were accepting entries, and I thought, you know what, this painting was uh, was special to me, um, and I entered this one, and then a studio painting that I had also really liked, and I believed in in those those pieces. Um, the one that won was from Planar Rockies last year, and. I, I did like the painting. I knew that it was um, it was going to be one of my better ones as I was creating it, which is always a fun thing to know. Um, but I, I got great feedback on it from other artists there at Planar Rockies. Um, so Jason Sacron, who won Best of Show 
really liked it and, you know, and told me that. And so I think having that kind of feedback on the painting and then, you know, and, and just personally liking it was enough motivation for me to go ahead and enter it in the salon. Well, it worked out pretty well for you, huh? It did. It did. I, I will not complain. <laughs> so I'm curious about um, since that time, since you won the salon, has there been anything yet that has occurred that um, may have been a result of that? Well, I've gotten into every planner festival I've applied to since then. So I think that that, that may have something to do with it. Wow. Um, Congratulations. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that creates some buzz. Um, I, the peer recognition has been the most meaningful thing um, because I've gotten messages from artists, um, many of whom I'd already heard of, just through the grapevine. And, and that's, that's been incredibly encouraging just to see that community um, you know, to, uh, reach out and, and sort of welcome me into the fold. Um, another thing that's been really exciting is the response locally. So in Kentucky, we have some planner painting groups and some, some folks who are active, but not really anybody who's ventured outside the state on a regular basis to do festivals. Um, but it, seeing the response here, um, just among my local planner painting group, and you know, I, I am part of a co-op studio that has 25 artists. And you know, they, they welcome me back with a, um, a round of applause when I walked <laughs> back in <laughs> in May. And it, it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, it really was. It, it was amazing to see that. And so I got a feature article in my hometown paper. You know, it was there was some exciting stuff going on here that I, I think was especially meaningful to me because planner painting is still kind of under the radar yeah. in Kentucky. Well, everywhere. Not just Kentucky, That's everywhere. True. You know, it, it, you know, a lot of people still ask me that question: of "What is what is this thing you call plein air painting or plein air painting?" Well, um, I, if I might ask, if, if it's not too inappropriate, what's your age range? <laughs> I'm thirty. I don't mind. You're thirty. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So that's, you know, that's really terrific that somebody who is younger uh, ha has had an opportunity to, to enter and win against, uh, you know, some pretty amazing painters. You told me a story after the plein air convention. I brought you up to the, to the, um, the studio and we did a little interview on video. And you told me a fascinating story about the painting itself that won. Can you tell our listeners what that story was? Sure. Yes. Um, this was probably my most adventurous planner painting I've ever done. Right. Um, it was yeah, and not, not by my choice necessarily, but I, I did this during the last week of planner Rockies, which is in Estes park, Colorado and takes place in the, the Rocky mountain national park. And we had thunderstorms like clockwork almost every afternoon because it was August but there was one day that we had a, a day free of thunderstorms. And I had already decided um, when I was scoping out different painting sites that I would hike up to Timberline Falls if we had a clear day. And because it was going to re require a bit of a, a trek. It ended up requiring a 10-mile round-trip hike because even though I got there before dawn, the, um, the parking lots at the trailheads were all full. <laughs> Oh, it was very, the, the park centennial. Oh yeah. So I had to park further down and then hike an extra two miles. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I got on the trailhead, um, or I got to the trailhead before dawn still, and then hiked up to Timberline Falls and it was a gorgeous hike. Um, I, I think that that actually helped clarify my vision for the painting, you know, to have a solid few hours of hiking, um, before and after. It also put some pressure on me to to turn this painting out and really focus intensely on on my process. So I, I think I mean, I think honestly, that pressure helped me because I knew I couldn't hike that far and come back with the dud of a painting. Um, so yeah, the painting process itself went smoothly. And I like I said, I, I knew even as I was creating this piece that it was going to be one of my better ones. How and much time so, did you have actually to paint? I think I spent six hours on it. Oh, wow. So it just happened quickly. You know, there wasn't, you know, oftentimes with a planner painting or any painting, I have a whole lot of push and pull and struggle. And it, this one, this one felt easier. Um, so, 
So uh, well, I, guess I, was- I, I, it's, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I apologize for that. Was, I had a very similar experience this summer. I learned about a new waterfall in the Adirondacks that I had never heard of, and it was on private property of this private club. And um, so same thing. We had to, we couldn't park at the beginning of the trailhead, so we had to hike extra. And there were about five of us decided to do it. And what we didn't know is it was a nine-mile round trip, so very oh, close yes. to the same And it just seemed like it was forever. Well, by the time we got there, we realized we only had 45 minutes because we had to turn around or because we'd be in the wilderness in the dark. So unlike your six hours, we had, you know, we had to whip something (laughs) together very rapidly. So anyway, you were on your way back. What happened then? Right. So I, I packed the painting up and that was that was already going to be a bit of an issue because I left my 14 by 18 panel carrier at home. And so I had to buy some twine at a hardware store the night before this big hike um, with the plan of tying it to the outside of my pack um, facing out on the way down. So <laughs> that's what I did. And it, it actually worked pretty well. Um, but I had to be careful not to brush up against anything or fall backwards <laughs> Um, and I got, I got nervous a couple times because there would be you know, a fellow hikers walking up behind me wanting to get close to the painting. And of course I, I knew the whole thing was completely wet. <laughs> well, is it, isn't the twine covering the paint kind of messing it up a little bit? I tied the panel holder to my pack. So the painting itself was, uh, was actually in mint condition. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, it was, it was nerve wracking knowing that I couldn't, you know, couldn't forget about it and brush up against a tree or anything crazy. So, um, and that got exponentially more nerve wracking about halfway down the mountain when I, I hadn't seen any fellow hikers for a while. I felt like I was, you know, pretty much solo hiking at that stage, but then came across a couple that had wandered off the side of the trail a little ways and they were taking photos of an elk calf. And the cow elk was right there and was was really unhappy about it. Um, <laughs> it was just it was so clear from her posture that she was, you know, it, maybe a few seconds away from charging at these folks. So I yelled at them to get back on the trail um, and they did. But that left me in a bit of a pickle because these elk were still right off the side of the trail and now I'm alone with that stretch of the trail ahead of me. <laughs> so, so I waited for a while and they actually did, they moved up the mountain a little bit to the point where I thought I might be able to pass by without, you know, making the mother feel threat, um, any kind of threat. And, and I did. Um, and right after I passed by the stretch where they were, they were a little up the trail, um, I heard something behind me and the mama elk had decided to tail me at close range. So <laughs> I, I walked a little faster, decided that I was going to wait until, you know, wait for a while to look over my shoulder again. But I, I could hear her right behind me and kept checking, you know, taking some glances over my shoulder to see how close she was. And she finally slowed down and gave me more space and then turned around eventually. But it was, it was pretty hair raising. <laughs> Yeah. I was worried about that painting too. I, that's that's probably a sign of how much I like this painting. Was I I I was thinking about my you know my physical safety, but I was also thinking about what would happen if she butted up against me because that painting was the first thing in the in uh, her her sight line. So. Oh, maybe she just was an art lover and she was trying to get a good look. Maybe I hadn't yeah. thought of that angle, but <laughs> you, you know, I think that's one of the things that I absolutely love about plein air painting is that um, almost every painting has some kind of a story attached to it. You know, maybe it's not an exciting uh, about to get butted by an elk, uh, but right. <laughs> uh, you know, there's usually some memory when you're outdoors and you're in this beautiful spot, and you know, there's Something, you know, maybe it's the mist of the waterfall hitting your face or maybe it's a uh, fish jumping or, you know, a, a, a mink or something swims out of the water. But there's always something. It's one of the reasons I, I tend to like to hang on to my studies and I use the studies to make bigger paintings for the galleries. What about you? How do you hang on to them? Do you sell them? What's your story? Um, I, I definitely photograph all of them. There are some that I hang on to um, if I think that they'll they'll do a good job scaling up. 
Um, the plein air events, the really most of them have to be for sale, and of course, oftentimes yeah. it's the best ones that get picked up. So, so I, I just try to make sure I take good photos in case I do eventually want to scale something up in the studio. Very and I've, I've done that from photos of paintings. You know, a photo of a painting, while it's not, you, you don't have the texture that you can see with a study, um, it's still better than a photo you take with a camera. Um, so, so yeah, I've, I've done that before. One of the things I thought we'd touch on, I remember when we talked before, uh, after uh, the plein air convention, that you had kind of an unconventional upbringing. I'd kind of like to have you touch on um, the way that you were raised and then how that all resulted in you doing art at such a young age. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my mom homeschooled me and my two younger sisters and she did that mostly so that we can travel and learn on the road. So we went to lots of museums and historical sites and we, we learned about those things firsthand. So she was first and foremost a student of history, and so we'd read about every subject, whether it was art or science, um, mathematics, anything else. We, we would learn through all of that through the lens of its story. And I love that because it gave everything a context and a deeper sense of meaning. Your mom's a hero. That's hard work. She, she is. She is. Now she watches my, my son quite a bit. I have a two-year-old boy. So um, my, my studio time is basically determined uh, by, by her, um, her desire to hang out with her grandson. So, oh, that's nice. <laughs> so I, I owe her big time. But well, I really and, do think And I think what's interesting is um, you were homeschooled, and yet you got accepted into Harvard. Right. Um, and that, it was a surprise to me, honestly, but, um, my art had a big thing, a big, a big role to play in that, according to my admissions counselor. Um, and I, I really think a lot of, you know, so I started landscape painting, um, painting on plein air when I was in grade school with watercolor. So by the time I was eight or nine, I would, I had watercolors and would take them whenever we went on, on a vacation or you know, went traveling somewhere. Well, how did that happen? Did you know about uh, painting outdoors or is it, it had somebody shown you how to do it or is it just decided to start doing it? Um, I, I started painting and drawing really early. I took lessons from a Russian artist when I was six. Um, and who but, was that? Uh, his name was, is Dmitry Ignatovich. And um, he, he moved back to Russia. i I think he, well, he moved to Maine first when I was nine. So I only had about a three year window to take lessons with him. Um, but it got me started. And so I, I took the paints outside, um, just kind of on my own. I knew people had done it because I saw sketches done by Sargent in museums. Um, and I, I loved Winslow Homer. So I, I knew people took, took paints outside, but I, I just didn't think it was something anybody, or I didn't know that it was something people still did, um, at that point. And um, so, yeah, it wasn't until, I guess, early middle school that I discovered Plein Air Magazine, um, or maybe, it may have been American Artist at that point. I'm not sure. I guess Plein Air was probably being published right around then, too. But I, I learned about, um, about the more contemporary movement. But even then, it still seemed removed. So I, I bought a, an oil painting Plein Air set up um, when I was going to travel to Europe solo at 17 and my first ever planner painting experience in oil was in in the south of france i was in marseille staying with some extended family friends and they um and, and i i remember setting up in front of the old port and it was a beautiful place to paint but i painted my painting in direct sunlight and not only did i have to um, deal with that once I got back inside. But, um, but as I was painting, a whole bunch of sailors had a, a day off. And so they decided that it was going to become a spectator thing. So I, I had to deal with all these, uh, these cat calling Mediterranean <laughs> sailors. <laughs> so it's kind of a wonder I stuck with it, but, uh, <laughs> I, I, I learned to paint by, um, you know, when I started in oils at 12, I'd, I was painting in the studio workshop setting here in Lexington and I learned to paint by copying several of John Singer Sargent's paintings. Hmm. So he really, he was my inspiration and, you know, was a, a great teacher. So I, 
I, I still remember going to the National Gallery when that traveling exhibition went through, I think in 99, and, and just spending hours and hours in front of those paintings. Um, so, that, that really motivated me to dive into oils. So what is your perspective as a 30-year-old? Um, uh, you know, the plein air movement is filled with a lot of different people of a lot of different ages, but there tends to be a lot more people who are kind of on the edge of their careers or have retired. Um, what's that feel like to you? Is that a good thing? Uh, is, is it a, a beautiful thing being one of the younger people? Are there a, a lot more younger people that you're encountering? What, give me a sense of that. I'm certainly encountering some. I think the holdback for a lot of people my age is just the uncertainty associated with um, trying to make an income as a as a landscape or planner painter. Mm -hmm. And um, so I I think that that does hold some folks back, especially when the you know we graduated. Well, I, I graduated in 2009 from college, and so that was right after the the big economy meltdown. So it, it was a, it was in some ways a difficult time to go into art, but it, for me, that moment was clarifying because as all of my friends were losing their offers from, um, you know, from Lehman brothers and, and other, other big banks and consulting firms, um, I, I thought, well, is this what I would really want to do anyway? <laughs> so I, that, that it helped motivate me towards pursuing painting full time. So was your original plan to, um, to, to build a career in some other thing? I, I knew I loved painting, but I didn't, I certainly didn't attend college in order to paint. We only had two painting professors and they ended up letting go of one of them while I was there. Um, and, and so I, I didn't, I didn't plan on, um, on majoring in art in college. Um, but I, I wanted to leave my options open. I wanted to paint, but I also knew that I really wanted to study with people whose work, I, I absolutely loved. So that that would point me more towards the atelier setting um, or, or doing workshops. And so, yeah, my thought partway through college was that I would continue to get my liberal arts degree. And then, you know, I could have the option of really doing doing any number of things. Um, but it, it just, I, the first thing I wanted to try was painting. And if that worked, that was that was my top choice. So. <laughs> It was, uh, it was actually kind of, it was interesting because the week that I graduated, they did this huge survey of my college class and they had people list the sector of their dream job and then the sector that they were actually going into. And one of the biggest dream job sectors was the arts. And that was, of course, a tiny little sliver of what people were actually planning on doing. Um, and, and so it, it almost made me feel kind of, I mean, I felt lucky that I was going ahead and doing a deep dive into something that, um, you know, that most other people wanted to do, but just didn't really, I guess, have the, the margin or the, um, the confidence to try. So what was the um, quality of the painting instructors without mentioning names? Um, many of the universities are focusing on other types of art. Uh, what, what was your experience at Harvard? Well, I never even took a class. Um, really? I applied, yeah, I, I applied to one my senior year and um, got got rejected, even though a number of senior football players got in. So <laughs> I wasn't going to look into that too closely. I figured by that point it was um, it was late enough, and I I I had already planned on going more the workshop route after that. Um, but I, I majored in history and literature, and it in a way it has shaped my my work as a planner painter much more than I would have imagined. Wow. Um, so I didn't, I didn't plan it this way. Well, I, I studied medieval history specifically and looked at how, how people moved within the landscape in search of transformative spiritual experiences. So, you, you know, you think about medieval pilgrimage where people would travel miles in order to see a spiritual site that had some sort of you know, longstanding significance, um, and, and would, you know, they would be moved to tears by it. And, and, and they would, you know, drop everything, sell their homes and go on these long journeys when travel was extremely difficult, um, in order to, you know, to, it, it sort of served as, I guess, a metaphor for the, the spiritual journey or the life journey. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I, I did my, 
my thesis on mountains as sites of epic spiritual transformation hmm. in, in a number of medieval narratives. And it was it, it's fascinating because that you know those thoughts really come to mind um, frequently for me as a planner painter, especially when I'm in a remote landscape. Um, because a place, you know, when you think about a place's history, it becomes so much more significant. Um, it's not just scenery when when you know a place's story. And when you think about the generations of people in the past who've stood upon the same ground and taken in the same surroundings that you are as a planner painter. Um, and that, uh, to me, that just gives a place so much more meaning and power. It's um, very humbling to stand in the exact spot where someone uh, from the past who's who's become well known, you know, church or mm -hmm. or coal or someone like that is it to stand in that spot and paint that same scene in your own way and know that that ground touched their feet. That's pretty cool. It is. I mean, it's humbling because it makes you realize how brief life is. Yep. But I think on a more you know the, the more powerful feeling I get is that it 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 gives me this deep sense of connectedness. You know that we're all tapping into this sense of beauty or transcendence or whatever it was that, you know, that moves us to paint these places. Um, and, and we're, you know, we're, we're really following those same footsteps. Is there a spiritual component for you? I, I have gotten to know um, some of the Russian painters extremely well. And as a matter of fact, uh, very quickly, um, I'm going to be in Russia painting with some of them. And for them, the act of painting is essentially an act of prayer or a, a <laughs> spiritual experience. Anything like that going on for you? Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, I, I think of the historical component, but then, you know, for me, I, I gravitate towards landscapes that have this drama, you know, something that's really compelling that would make me stop and look at it and just be, you know, transformed by its beauty. And, and when I explore a remote landscape, I'm not getting away from humanity, but rather connecting to the heart of it all. And, um, you know, so it's so deeply human to have a powerful response to something that is beautiful and vast and enduring. Um, and I, I think often of what C.S. Lewis said about this. He described this phenomenon of, of feeling, you know, this, this point of almost this transcendent feeling of joy or longing. Um, he called those signposts and he, he, he listed in, in his book, surprised by joy. He listed a number of times when he had, um, had felt this powerful sense of joy or connectedness. And, and, you know, for him, it pointed towards a deeper lasting glory. Um, and, and for me, it does the same, you know, like I, when I, when I see something that just takes my breath away, um, it, it, makes it causes me to worship um and i think we we all worship something um but yeah for for me at, i i share lewis's belief that these things really do point us towards a a true glory um and something that we will experience and you know in, in a far off land so so it's it, it does give what i do as a painter a profound sense of meaning um, you know, to try to capture those moments of, of fleeting beauty and take it all in. You're, you're, uh, you're very intelligent, very, very deep thinker. I, I think that uh, what I'd like to do is move into a different direction now. One of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do is to try and bring more people into plein air painting because I think, and, and quite frankly, even painting itself, because painting opens our eyes and changes our hearts um, we see the world differently once we start studying light and looking at the, you know, the form and the shape and the, the way light hits trees and so on. What is the way that we can, as a, I, I don't like the word industry because we're not an industry, but it, we're a movement. Uh, what is the way that we can get more people of your age and younger people engaged? What is the process that you would like to see that the various organizations or local clubs do to kind of enhance this plein air force that we've been working on to try and get more and more people into this so that this movement, which is the largest art movement in the history of art, more people painting in plein air than any other movement that I think has ever existed. 
And what can we do to keep it moving forward, keep it alive, keep it growing, keep bringing new, younger people in, as well as, of course, people, anybody is welcome? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the demonstrations and workshops are are kind of a natural fit. And, um, you know, now workshops are, tend to be populated mostly by, you know, by people who are, are older than me. Um, although I do have one younger woman taking my workshop coming up next week. So I was, I was thrilled to see that there's somebody, you know, somebody my age in Kentucky pursuing plenary painting. Um, but, but yeah, overall, it, it's not something that, that millennials are, are sort of diving into. Well, I, why not? I think why not? As, well, I, I, I think that there's, there would be a desire there um, because there's, I, I, I think due to growing up kind of surrounded by, by media and by marketing, um, it, there's an authenticity to paint. You know, there's a tactile feeling to it since you're working with your hands. And it's something that, that people in my generation would love. And they do love it when they try it. Um, but so many people get discouraged in art class pretty early on. You know, I, I meet people all the time who say, oh, I would love to be able to do that, but I couldn't draw a stick figure. And, and you know, people of all ages will say that, but I hear it a lot more from people my age and, you know, when they can, um, you know, that it's, I think that there's, there would be an opening there, but we would have to make it more accessible. So go to places where, you know, where people gather, whether it's, um, you know, having, doing a demo at, at an open air thing or a farmer's market or, you know, just, uh, at, um, in the middle of a city, um, and, and making that something that we do instead of keeping our demos kind of limited to, um, you know, to workshop attendees and. All right. So um, I, I, you've just come up with something that's brilliant. So here's the instructions for every, <laughs> everyone who is listening, sure. everyone who's listening. I want you to pick up the phone and call and make arrangements with your local farmer's market. And I want you to go out on your Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday, whatever it is, and set up and paint. You don't have to be there to sell. You just set up and paint and engage people. And let's have everybody really work to engage anybody, but try to pull some younger people in and, and maybe give them a little mini lesson and try to encourage them. And then, you know, maybe you can turn them into a student, right? Mm -hmm. That is true. And I think also reaching out to high school art programs. I mean, high school art arts are losing funding um, all across the nation. And so teachers would love to have some input from, and from professional artists. This coming from um, someone who did not actually go to a high school. Right, right. I, <laughs> I knew a few people. <laughs> I knew a few people. We have a, we have, you know, an, an arts magnet program in Lexington and I knew some folks who did that, but even that, you know, they, they just had such limited funding for art supplies and art supplies are, you know, there's some big overhead, um, even if day to day, I don't actually have to spend a whole lot once I, you know, bought the easel and um, all the other stuff. So I, I, I really, I think that would be another opportunity. I, one of the artists who shares my studio space taught in the public schools for his entire career. And, um, and, and he, he had a number of students who would have loved to just have the opportunity to, to go painting. So maybe it's opening up your local plan our paint outs to a couple of high school students to come along for the ride. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that would be another way. Well, to people who want to do that, to people who want to do that, um, go to plenairforce.com, P-L-E-I-N-A-I-R force.com. On there is a documentary that we produced uh, called Outside the Lines. It's the history of plein air painting, but at the end of it, it kind of goes into you can do this, encouragement kinds of things. And we designed mm -hmm. that so local painters wouldn't have to try to fill up an hour speech or something. They could go in, and introduce themselves, and be at a at a at a school um, assembly or something, and say, "Hey, my name is Mary, and this is what I do." But let me tell you more about it by p playing this video. You play the video, and then you answer questions, and then you try to get together, uh, you know, some kind of a plein air group, and say, "Listen, I'll provide easels and paint to anybody who wants to come and try this," because. It, that's how we're going to get people engaged. If they try it, I, I think that a lot of young people don't even realize it's an option for them. You know, they're right. all they're being pushed on sports or they're being pushed on on other things, activities in their schools. But 
nobody ever talks about plein air painting. My daughter is a, a student, an art student in her high school. I don't think she was ever exposed to it through the school. Clearly, she was exposed through me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she couldn't really avoid that. I'm no, sure. no, no. So she's like, Dad, I'm not going painting. <laughs> Someday, someday. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, when they were little and they were sweet, yeah, they went painting with me all the time. <laughs> I'm excited for my son to reach that stage. He's, like I said, he's two right now, but he loves being outside. Um, it, yeah, even as a newborn, if he ever got upset, we would just walk right outside with them, um, no matter what the weather was like, and he would calm down. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's why I paint. That, exactly. You, know, I, you, you, you cannot. <laughs> Uh, how's stress in your body when you're painting? You completely, your different part of your brain is engaged. You completely lose all of your stress. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's a different kind of stress, but it's one that I enjoy. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's sort of a, a challenging, a, a challenge that is uh, is nothing, you know, for me, it's nothing but but fun. And I, I realize I might define fun differently from some people, but I, I really enjoy kind of pushing through a, a painting that's challenging or, um, you know, trying to really convert something that's three dimensional to two dimensions and paint. <laughs> so. so what's, what is next for you? What can we expect from Kathleen? Um, well, on, on, in terms of my event schedule, I've got a, some really fun ones coming up. I'm doing the Solomon's planner festival in September and that's in Solomon's Island, Maryland. And then, doing um cape and plein air in october so that's i think october 8th to 16th in rockport massachusetts and for me that's going to be a return to the old stopping grounds since i lived in boston for about eight years so i'm, I'm really looking forward to that and then the last one i'm doing is plein air texas and i've heard so many fabulous things about that event that i am i'm very excited to take part in it they've actually added a calf roping event this year. So they're going to take all the artists out to this uh, big San Angelo um, annual calf roping event that they have, and we'll, we'll get to paint the sights and sounds. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled about that. Cool. Excellent. Sounds like you've got some good things going on. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you're an inspiration to me. Um, it's a pleasure getting to know you, watching you, watching your career. And congratulations again on winning the, the big prize for the Plein Air Salon. And uh, we're looking Thank forward you. to watching you and uh, seeing what you're going to be doing over the, the course of the next few decades. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It really, it, it felt like kind of a, almost a commission to get that, that award at this stage in my career. You know, like it was a, a charge to go out and, and, get better and just, yeah, I mean, to keep, keep growing and pushing ahead. So in that sense, it was, it was more than just an honor. It was a, it was a, a mission. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Make good use of it. <laughs> well, thanks again to Kathleen and thank you for being our prize winner and entering the plein air salon. It's pretty cool. And the $15,000, that's kind of nice, too. Today's interview was brought to you by the new Figurative Art Convention and Expo. You can learn more at figurativeartconvention.com. Podcast was sponsored by Fall Color Week Publishers Invitational. Come to Maine, paint for a week. Come on home. You're going to have a great time. You deserve it. Fallcolorweek.com. Well, the plein air movement continues to be red hot, which is why plein air magazine is now the top selling representational art magazine sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. Stop by, pick one up, or get a subscription of your own for about half of what you pay at the newsstand, pleinairmagazine.com. This is always fun for me. Let's do it again sometime. I hope it's fun for you. Like next week, we'll see you. All right, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye. <laughs>